Kalispera Seolus. Welcome to everybody. I start with congratulations. Congratulations to Greece, the BSA's host country, on the bicentenary of the events that led to the creation of the modern Greek nation state in 1832. In a year full of celebrations, many sponsored by the two main Greek committees, Greece 2021 and Protovolia 1821 to 2021, the BSA is delighted to be making its own small contribution uh, within the 21 in 21 initiative led by Korais Chair uh, Ronda Van Steen and funded by the AG Levendis Foundation. Next Monday and the following Monday, the BSA is co-sponsoring with King's College London and the Hellenic Society, a pair of virtual panel discussions on 1821, the migration of revolutionary ideas. Before this bicentenary year began, we produced a series of podcasts, 21 poems into 21, Greek poetry read in the original and in translation by 21 readers, including Victoria Hislop, Professor David Ricks, and Professor Roddy Beaton. In November, as a prelude for a general audience to this, this year's centenary, bicentenary celebrations, Roderick Beaton uh, lectured on From the Europe of Empires to the Europe of Nation States, the Greek Revolution of 1821 in international context, 200 years on. Let me add my own welcome as director of the BSA to everyone joining us wherever you are. Although we cannot unfortunately experience the great pleasure of an opportunity to meet colleagues, friends and supporters in person, I sincerely hope, as we all do, that when I deliver this summary of the BSA's activities next year, it will once again be possible to have a conversation and to share a glass after the presentation. The COVID-19 pandemic that emerged at the very beginning of 2020, but really began to impact our lives in Europe in March, offered in the unnatural quiet of the first lockdown, an opportunity for reflection, retrospection and re-evaluation. Reflection and retrospection on the BSA's long history in Greece and re-evaluation of the ways in which we carry out our activities. A retrospective glance back at our annual reports revealed the following in the 1893 to four report. I quote, in October last year, it was very difficult to reach Greece owing to the quarantine imposed on all Mediterranean ports. I accordingly went out by sea all the way from Liverpool. A reminder that the current pandemic is not new nor are sometimes inconvenient but necessary measures to prevent the spread of disease. Retrospection and re-evaluation also took us into new territory, digitization and digital dissemination of both materials and events. During the first lockdown, we explored the earliest years of the BSA's existence with two sets of short videos shared via social media and still available on our expanding video archive. The first focused on Richard Claverhouse Jebb, an early advocate of the establishment of the British School of Athens, was based on a lecture by Christopher Stray, who supplied the voiceover. The series explored the many memorials around the BSA's Athens premises and how Jeb remains in, in the background, despite his important role in our founding. The second on Emily Penrose and two other women who also lived in the director's residence, Mary Gardner and Ellen Bosenkett. And this was narrated by Dr. Amara Thornton from the University of Reading and explored their lives in Athens and their subsequent careers. Although a bit of fun during the anxious days of the first lockdown, Hidden Histories helped us to test our digital capabilities and highlighted the important resources that the archive contains for social and disciplinary history. We had already launched our digital collections platform, as I noted a year ago, to make publicly available the rich collections in Athens. But the lockdown spurred us both to accelerate existing plans and to identify other materials to make accessible anywhere in the world via our website. Plans existed for a major project to unite virtually the archives of the BSA's early excavations at Mycenae, which are physically located both in Cambridge and in Athens. The launch was timed for a physical event, marking the centenary of those excavations in April 2020. That physical event had to be postponed, but the digital materials went live in June, and the collection has already been nominated for as a digital innovation of the year by Apollo magazine. Another ongoing project that progressed more quickly 
is the Society for Promotion of Hellenic Studies BSA image collection, a photographic reference and loan collection amassed in the late 19th to mid 20th century by the Society for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies that includes photographs from the BSA documenting our early research. Of the just over 7,000 records, 93% have now been scanned and just over 50% are available through our digital collections. Other collections made available in 2020 include the 1887 diary of Emily Penrose, daughter of Francis Penrose, the first BSA director, notebooks of Sir William Gell, Keppel Craven and Flinders Petrie, and the records of the 1896 excavations at Kinosarges. Most were accompanied by a blog posted by a blog post highlighting an aspect of the collection. 14 went up in 2020, including blogs relating to different aspects of Mycenae and the uh, representations of Mycenae in the early to late 20th century, on the English Photographic Company, on the BSA's first excavations prior to 1900, and on Dawkins's travel to collect material on modern Greek dialects. These blogs joined the Fitch Lab blogs already established and were followed by a new series, Library Stories. All are available on our website. By late summer, travel restrictions allowed visitors to reach us and the assistant director took advantage to have a blitz on completing the digital documentation of the BSA's museum study collection using the three weeks in August and September when we would have hosted the BSA's undergraduate summer course. Parts of this collection have been published already in the annual of the BSA but the aim this summer was to complete a full inventory with a view eventually to making the collection public when possible through digital collections. The small team of volunteers, a mixture of travelers and those based in Greece, worked at workstations spaced throughout the premises, observing all COVID-19 hygiene measures. The team's efforts generated some 60 gigabytes of high quality digital data, 2,680 database records and almost 1,500 photographs and the museum study collection inventory is now complete and fully accessible within the BSA on our intranet, a real milestone. Another late summer initiative was a small quarantine art exhibition organized by three participants in the 2019 undergraduate summer course, Charlotte Ellery, Katie Robb, both from King's College London and Flora Outram from St. Andrews. The main exhibition was online, but a selection including work by our chair, uh, went on display over two weekends at the BSA uh, itself. An uplifting initiative and a strong indication of the affection inspired by the BSA's undergraduate course, which will be run for the 50th time in 2022. To capture that feeling, we're compiling pictures and short texts for a book of reminiscences from, out, from throughout the course's history. The pandemic affected the normal schedule of courses, all of which had to be postponed. For the undergraduate course this year, we whetted students' appetites for its future running in situ with a one-day virtual seminar with contributions from the assistant director, the director, A.G. Levendis fellow, Bella Dimova, and Anastasia Vasiliou, then working on the digitization project. We still hope to run courses in 2021, but have plans in place for virtual presentations should that not be possible. Please keep an eye on our website for, for updates. We didn't sacrifice more conventional ways to engage the pr primarily academic community. We published both our print journals, volume 50, 115 of the Annual of the British School at Athens and volume 66 of Archaeological Reports, the latter produced in collaboration with the Hellenic Society. AG Online continued, of course, in collaboration with the French School at Athens, and the database has now reached over 9,500 entries. 2020 saw a further volume in our in-house supplementary series, Coffee Revisited by Sarah Wallace. And it's also pleasing that the fruits of a joint BSA British School at Rome uh, project on Adriatic connections will appear next month as Byzantium, Venice and the Medieval Adriatic, edited by, edited by Magdalena Skoblar, the second in our CUP series. We also anticipate two further volumes, the ninth and 10th, uh, in our Modern Greek and Byzantine Studies series published by Routledge before the end of this year. February 24th, 2020 was the last date on which an in-person event was held in Athens on the left. A book launch jointly with the Royal Asiatic Society of a volume documenting the earliest Ottoman tax register of the Peloponnese. 
Our last in-person event in London was on the 4th of March, when there was an exclusive preview of the National Geographic Cosmote TV documentary on Keros, the mystery of the broken idols, narrated by Costas Pascalidis of the National Archaeological Museum. The film was premiered in Athens, uh, in Greece, uh, in October, a virtual launch with participants distributed across several studios. And I strongly recommend uh, the film to you if you've not had a chance to see it. In July, uh, a second documentary on Keros, made by the Greek national broadcaster ERT, was broadcast, The Enigma of Keros, Do Enigma Tiskeru, narrated by Andriana Paraskevopoulou. Since those seemingly heady days of close contact, all our events have been delivered digitally and have to date received almost 4,000 views, with people joining quite literally from around the world. Our first upper house virtual seminar was delivered by Professor Mike Edwards, the BSA visiting fellow last year on the 27th of April. Mike spoke about his research on places in the Attic Orators, his goal to compile a topographical dictionary of places mentioned with a view to producing a commentary on them of value both to students and to scholars reading the texts. After getting as far as reading Antiphon and Ossides, Isaias and some Demosthenes and making frequent field trips to pinpoint locations, he, like most of our residents, left the BSA in March as flights became unavailable. Other upper house seminars ranged across topics such as the use of the terms Christos, Christi in funerary monuments by Macmillan Rodevolt student, Dr. Carrie Sautel, the history of Ottoman period Greece by Elias Kolovos of the University of Crete, the use and medical legal framework of Amenagogues and Mabaltifacients from 1830 to 1967 by Professor Violetta Chionidou of Newcastle University, 3D doc digital documentation and curation of archaeological data by Professor Marcos Katsianis, University of Patras, and just last week, C.P. Cavafi as a diasporic poet by Dr. Fotini Dimuruli of the University of Oxford. Public lectures started again in May with the annual Bader Archive Lecture delivered by Professor Andonis Kapsonas of the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at New York University on politics, research agendas, and the history of archaeology in Crete, with a focus on Lictos between 1880 and 1940. Her Excellence Kate Smith, the UK Ambassador to Greece, spoke on Gennadius in London in June, followed by Professor Michael Scott from Warwick on the view from the Aegean, global perspectives on a global ancient world. And July saw Professor Paul Cartledge of Cambridge speak about Thebes, the nearly lost city of ancient Greece. The new academic year brought a joint lecture with the Center for, Hellenic, uh, for Historic Research of the National Hellenic Research Foundation by Professor Christy Constantakopoulou from Birkbeck College on gods, slaves, goats, and pirates in the Aegean Islands. Finally, Robert Parker from Oxford delivered a very well-received talk to the Friends of the BSA on new discoveries and new problems in Greek religion. And we closed 2020 with Bethany Hughes in discussion on the topic In Search of the Goddess of Love by Land and Sea. We also staged our first virtual panel on Beyond Words, History and Translation in Modern Greek Fiction, moderated by Professor David Vricks of King's College. The panelists were Professor Karen Emmerich of Princeton, Lambrini Huzeli, a journalist and translator, and the BSL's own Joshua Barley, another translator. And finally, we were very pleased to in initiate a collaboration with the Greek Politics Specialist Group, co-organized by Drs. Lambrini Rory of Exeter University and Irini Karamuzi of Sheffield, both former BSA Early Career Fellows, to host a series of seminars over the academic year. The first of these in October was by Dimitris Sotiropoulos of, of Athens University on populism, politics, and the economic crisis, comparing the cases of Greece with the case of Portugal. Dr. Bella Dimova, our AG Levendis Fellow in Hellenic Studies, continued her research on the textile economy of Greece and the Southern Balkans in the classic to, classical to Hellenistic periods. As she moves from the second to third year of her three-year fellowship, data collection was a priority. And despite delays caused by the closure of museums and travel restrictions, she studied textile tools in several significant Northern Greek sites, including Olynthos. She also examined mineralized textile remains from the cemetery at Avdira, and possibly the earliest animal fiber textile found in Greece from Elion in Boeotia. 
In addition to co-organizing a session at the European Archaeological Association's virtual meeting and working on several publications, she has also collaborated with BSA Fitch laboratory colleagues on the analysis of textile production tools from Corinth. The BSA has been fortunate to enjoy the support from the A.G. Levendis Foundation and from Charles Williams for postdoctoral fellowships in Hellenic Studies and Ceramic Petrology, respectively. We were therefore delighted when we were awarded significant funded by the funding by the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for another three-year postdoctoral fellowship in Modern Greek Studies, to be known as the 1821 Fellowship, marking the bicentenary year in which it has been established. The post has just been advertised and the initial appointee will work closely with the BSA's George Finlay archive, overseeing the digitization of materials most relevant to the years around 1821. She or he will wor also work on the papers of the London Greek Committee, founded in 1823 and held in the National Library of Greece, and will organize a conference in 2023 to mark that bicentenary. Finley is understandably popular in this bicentennial year, and other items from his archive at the BSA will feature in an exhibition, Edina Athena, The Greek Revolution and the Athens of the North, 1821 to 2021, to be held in Edinburgh starting in October, funded again by the A.G. Levendis Foundation and part of the, of the Protovulia 1821 to 21, 2021 programme. Despite travel restrictions, the BSA's arts bursary holder for last year, Saima Tariq from the University of the Arts of London, arrived in Greece in May and spent the first two weeks in quarantine reading about the focus of her project, Constantinos Doxiadis and his important role as the master planner of Pakistan's new capital, Islamabad, often touted as his greatest project, an exemplar of his dream of a world-class Dinapolis. Once she reached the Doxiadis archive, Saima realized that Pakistan's history can often only be gleaned from first-hand records kept elsewhere. The Doxiadis archive was a treasure trove, reams of well-kept diaries, photographs, correspondence and personal notes transcribed from dictaphone recordings. And this offered another picture of Pakistan, its dreams and actualizations of modernity. Simon now plans an audiovisual work around Doxiadis' townships in Islamabad's fringes to tell the story of how an ambitious Greek man somehow made Pakistan a poster child for global development. As already noted, Dr. Carrie Sautel, last year's Macmillan Rodevold student, explored non-citizen commemoration with a focus on epigraphy, specifically epitaphs, considering the use of the terms Christos and Christi, variously translated as excellent, useful, good or worthy, and in the fourth century BC Attic epitaphs almost exclusively associated with slaves. She aimed to collect all attestations of these terms in classical and Hellenistic Greece and consider how consistently the adjective denoted slaves in fourth century Attic epitaphs. Tulsi Parikh from Cambridge, last year's Richard Bradford McConnell student, worked on completing her doctoral thesis on the material, polyth the material of polytheism in archaic Greece, investigating, based on material evidence, how the many Greek gods were understood in relation to one another and as part of the same religion. She compared votive assemblages at over 20 archaic sanctuaries and in Attica, Central Greece, the Peloponnese and in the island to determine patterns of dedicatory practice across Greece, which she then used as a window into the mindset of ancient worshippers. Both Carrie and Tulsi returned to the UK in March and continued their research there, Tulsi submitting her thesis in September. This year's uh, researchers are Dr. Rosanna Valenti and Matteo Randazzo, both from Edinburgh University. And Carrie and Tulsi were joined last year by Dr. Ellen Finn from Trinity College Dublin funded by a two-year postdoctoral award from the Leverhulme Foundation to research moving, making, meaning, manuports in the archaeology of the Bronze Age Aegean. A manuport is, and I quote, an artifact of, or natural object that is transported, but not necessarily modified and deposited by humans, end quote. It is thus made by human action, but not through the more familiar processes of manufacture or physical modification entailing a conceptual transition between our categories of natural and artificial. Ellen is focusing on multiple case studies of manuports from across the Bronze Age Aegean at a range of different sites, including tombs, sanctuaries, shrines, and palatial complexes. 
Archaeology normally forms a significant part of the BSA's activities, but as with many other organizations, the intricate logistics of assembling teams in the field, often from multiple countries, proved too risky in the unusual summer of 2020. In one sense, the timing of the pandemic was opportune because the BSA had only planned two fieldwork projects that year, an excavation and underwater survey at the eastern edge of the site of Palekastro in East Crete, and an archaeological survey on the island of Chios. These projects will roll forward to this year when, assuming permits are granted and funding is awarded, they will join new excavation projects at Neolithic uh, Tumba Seron, Late Antique Catochoria on Naxos, and Carfi at the Bronze Age Iron Age transition high up in the mountains of East Central Crete, plus another multi-period survey project in Western Samos. More to say on these projects in next year's report. Other projects had already progressed to study mode, Olynthos, Kutulumagula, Keros Naxos Seaways and Knossos Gipsades. While study may seem less exciting than active fieldwork, it is the most crucial, crucial stage of any project in turning raw fieldwork data into a coherent format, suitable for dissemination to a wider audience, academic and otherwise. In the case of Kutrulu, study produced a major surprise. After radiocarbon dating, the well-preserved burial excavated in 2018 and shown here, proved not to be Byzantine as originally thought, but returned to date in the late seventh millennium BC, the Middle Neolithic. Although no fieldwork took place, communication with colleagues in the Ministry of Culture and Sports still continued, and the BSA expresses its gratitude, as always, to colleagues there for their support and collaboration in very trying times for us all. Mr. Yorgos Didaskalu, Secretary General of the Ministry, Dr. Polixeni Adam Baleni, Director General of Antiquities, and Dr. Elena Kunduri, Director of Prehistoric and Classical Antiquities, as well as numerous others in the Ministry and those in charge of the relevant efforts of antiquities. We also recognize the generous financial support from a wide range of bodies and individuals that sustains our projects in the field. On the island of Ebia, uh, Eubia, the Lefkandi project was able to conduct a short study season, both in its storeroom in Lefkandi and in the Eretria Museum. A highlight of this was a visit by the Minister of Culture and Sports, Dr. Lina Mendoni, to the new museum of Chalchida and the site of Lefkandi Tumba, seen here on the left, where she was guided by Professor Irini Lemos of University of Oxford, director of the Lefkandi project. Lefkandi wasn't the only site to receive a distinguished visitor. In August, the president of the Hellenic Republic, Her Excellency Katerina Sakalaropoulou, visited Keros and Daskalio, accompanied by Dr. Michael Boyd from Cambridge, co-director of the Keros Naxos project. The president also took in the new exhibition on the island of Kufonisi, called Impressions, which includes material excavated on Keros. The project was otherwise highly visible with the two television documentaries I just mentioned. It's difficult to believe that it was just over a year ago that we were sitting in Carlton House Terrace, listening to Fitch Laboratory Director, Dr. Vangelia Kiriadzi, review the work of the Fitch over the past 10 years. Only a couple of weeks earlier, a lively community of long-term staff, postdoctoral scholars, academic visitors, doctoral students and undergraduates and interns from various institutions in the UK, Europe and beyond had welcomed in the new year. That same month, as I noted last year, saw a one-day symposium on distant seas, connected worlds that brought together in Athens experts in Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean archaeology, as well as British archaeology, to discuss long-distance connectivity and maritime trade in the late antique, early Byzantine period. The event marked the close of the, fit, of the, of the Fitch phase of a British Academy funded project, the last of a series of projects completed that academic year. The repercussions of the pandemic changed work patterns and interactions in the Fitch, making 2020 an unusual year, but definitely not a, not a quiet or unproductive one. A year of solitary work in the laboratory, wearing masks and maintaining physical distance but also a year of vibrant online discussions, meetings, lectures and seminars. The need to work mainly from home conditioned the practicalities of research, shifting the emphasis towards areas like the preparation of publications. Many were submitted, some have already appeared. I single out only one publication that is close to submission, 
a monograph by Fitch associate Yorgia Kordatsaki in collaboration with Evangelia Kiriatsi and others listed on the slide. The fruits of a long-term collaboration with the Austrian Academy of Sciences and the Austrian Archaeological Institute. It concerns the study and analysis of pottery from the early Mycenaean site of Kakovatos in the Western uh, Peloponnese, characterized by two of the largest and most richly furnished tholos tombs of its time. Interdisciplinary study of the find from old and new excavations, both in the tombs and on the Acropolis, sheds light on intriguing aspects of the site's history, such as the process of Mycenaeanization of local craft traditions and the connections direct or indirect with my known Crete. However, work was not solely devoted to preparation of publications. Within the limitation on, limitations on numbers of personnel permitted in the laboratory at any one time, emphasis was placed on preparing thin sections and processing an elemental analysis of an unprecedented number of archaeological and geological samples for the needs of more than 25 research projects, both based at the Fitch and in many other institutions across Europe. That was possible thanks to the ded dedication and hard work of Zoe Guleta, Fitch Administrator and Analytical Assistant, and Michalis Sakalis, our highly experienced thin section preparation technician. Measurements of samples through the WDXRF spectrometer were monitored mostly remotely from home by Noemi Muller, the Fitch's scientific research officer. The Fitch lab director coordinated these efforts by various online means from Viber and WhatsApp to Zoom and Teams. Considerable lab-based work and some limited field work was undertaken in 2020 for a new large-scale project on revisiting ceramic provenance in the northern Peloponnese, led by Carlotta Gardner, the current Williams Fellow in Ceramic Petrology, in close collaboration with Noemi Muller and Evangelia Kiriatsi. The multi-aspect project, marking the Fitch's return to the area after a long break, aims to revisit the question of accurately distinguishing ceramics from a number of production centres in the area a highly contested issue because of the area's homogeneous geology. The current project promises to achieve this through a fresh and more holistic methodological approach, exploring the ceramic landscapes, potting traditions, production organization and trade patterns in two neighboring cities, Corinth and Sikion, during the first millennium BC. The work is funded by the Finding Old Sikion project and by the Fitch Laboratories Williams Fellowship Fund. Building upon earlier Fitch work by Ian Whitbread, Richard Jones and Louise Joyner on Corinthian clays and ceramics, the research involves close collaboration with Guy Sanders, previous director of the American School's Corinth Excavations, who has a deep knowledge of local ceramic products and experience of local potting resources, plus a team of early career researchers working on the publication of different categories of ceramic finds in the two sites. The BSA's A.G. Levendis fellow, Bella Dimova, already mentioned, who works on Lumites and Corinth, and Yorgos Yanakopoulos, Kiriaki Tsirtsi, and Zoe Spirandi, as well as Scott Gallimore, who studies Sikion ceramics. Research proceeds at two levels, that of the site and that of the region. At the site level, work is carried out independently on certain ceramic categories from both cities, fine wares as well as coarse wares. It involves macroscopic typological study and examination to understand manufacturing technology and moves on to the selection of samples that are subsequently analyzed, analyzed using thin section petrography and elemental analysis using the WDXRF machine. In the case of Corinth, the emphasis is on mortaria and loom weights, as well as on fine wares, categories of Corinthian products widely traded across and beyond the Aegean in the archaic and classical periods. In the case of Sikion, on the other hand, for the classical period, emphasis is placed on, placed, placed on types of fine and coarse wares that are considered typical for the city and are not common in Corinth. For Hellenistic and Roman Sikion, the emphasis is on kiln wasters from excavated workshop contexts. At the region level, the main question is how easy, if at all, it is, if it, if it is impossible at all, it is to distinguish between Corinthian products and those from Sikion or eventually other sites in the area, such as Aguira or Lucy. Here, the focus is on the comparison of relevant ceramic assemblages between neighboring cities, at present between Corinth and Sikion. Furthermore, emphasis is put on understanding the reasons for the potential, or not, to distinguish through the investigation of the raw materials available in the surrounding landscape. How different are raw materials around these sites? 
Are they all even appropriate for potting? How do they behave and how may they have been processed, altered or combined by ancient potters? An extensive program of raw material prospection and sampling has been undertaken in the area, combined with a series of replication experiments in the laboratory. The aim is to understand how ancient potters in the area process their raw materials and how their actions are reflected in the ceramics they produce. Through this multi-scalar approach, we hope eventually to define and also and so distinguish local potting traditions among cities based on clay recipes and manufacturing technology, as well as to map and understand variation in local products and assess the implications for re reconstructing production organization at the site level and trade and supply patterns within and beyond the region. Two key aspects of the laboratory's work and achievements so far a collaboration and the training of early career researchers. In these two areas, we continue to invest for the future of our institution and our field in Europe and beyond, as vividly demonstrated in this map. The BSA is participant through the Fitch Laboratory in two new collab collab collaboration projects to be launched in the next few months. The first, called PLACE, aims to train the next generation of archaeological scientists in the interdisciplinary study of pre-modern plasters and ceramics from the Eastern Mediterranean. The second, an international research network for portable XRF users around the Mediterranean will start later in the year and will focus on designing and producing kits of reference materials to ensure interlaboratory inter comparability and collaboration in this expanding field. As Carol alluded to, the last year was a grim one for reasons other than the pandemic. The BSA lost a number of good friends, staunch supporters and former officers. In the first category, we mourned the loss of Davina Huxley, wife of George Huxley and editor of Crete and Quests, a BSA volume that marked the centenary of BSA work on Crete published in 2000. Mati Egon Xila founded the Greek Archaeology Committee in UK in 1986, which has since then enabled many Greek students to undertake postgraduate study in the UK, many of whom surround Matty in this picture taken on the occasion, on an occasion at the BSA, to which she was a friend and regular visitor. Last year also saw the passing of Dr. Ian Jenkins, OBE, an exceptional mind and a generous and open-minded scholar, long-term curator of the British Museum, and also recently a member of the BSA's council. The BSA also lost three figures who were deeply involved in its activities over many years. Hugh Sackett passed on in April last year, former student of the BSA and assistant director. He is rightly well known and respected for his archeological work spanning much of the second half of the 20th century from Attica through Euboea to Knossos and Pelekastro on Crete. And he's seen here on the left on the summit of Castri at Pelekastro with uh, his younger colleagues Jan Driesen on the left and Sandy McGillivray on the right. Much of Hugh's work to his credit is published. Jim Coulton left us last year. In August, another much respected and valued colleague with a supreme understanding of Greek architecture. He worked at Perachora, where he first formulated his views on the Greek Stoa, on Lefkandi and at Philavrachos on Evia, on Euboea. And his reconstruction of the Tumba building at Lefkandi, seen here on the right, is much reproduced. Jim is also missed by the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens through his long association with the site of Zagara on Andros, as well as by his colleagues uh, at our sister institute, Biri Institute, the British Institute at Ankara, with whom he worked at Inuanda and Aphrodisias, as well as Balbura, and for which he was monographs editor for, for many years. A year ago, I remarked on the good fortune that Sinclair Hood was able to live to see the fruits of his labours on the Mason's Marks of Knossos, as seen in the bottom right of this image. He was then 103, but sadly passed away in January, a few days before his 104th birthday. His career at the BSA reaches back to the immediately post-war years. He was one of the last people alive who worked with Michael Ventris on the island of Chios, although he himself was a lifelong sceptic about Ventris's decipherment of Linear B. But Sinclair will be remembered most for his contribution to the archeology span of Knossos and to the BSA's physical presence there. The Knossos Stratigraphical Museum, the Strat as it is familiarly known, 
was his, initi his initiative, a suitable place to house the archeological collections stretching back to the time of Evans's first excavations. Our sincere condolences go to all of these people, or the, the, their families, friends, and colleagues. I don't wish to end, however, on a somber note, so turn briefly to the activities of the BSA's Knossos Research Center. For all too familiar reasons, 2020 saw none of the public facing events that have enriched its activities in recent years. But research continued there in the Strat, notably on the curation project that is systematically digitizing the collections it holds. A major thread has been our campaign to renew Sinclair's legacy, the Strat, which has been showing its age for some years now. The BSA's plans to rebuild have been approved by the Eureklian effort and await their final approval by the Eureklian Planning Authority. Our campaign has proceeded relatively quietly so far, given the constraints on events and travel, but we nevertheless have pledges or funding in place of around 400,000. And without wishing to tempt fate, took the rash step of creating a totalizer for our December 2020 newsletter. We recently produced a parallel Greek version of our brochure for the project we have named Knossos 2025, and we gained a patron in 2020, best-selling novelist Victoria Hislop. We anticipate a much more public campaign when in-person events are once again feasible, both in the UK and in Greece. Watch this space. Without its staff, the BSA would simply not function. And 2020 saw two changes in Athens. Dr. Chavdar Tsotchev left his post as IT officer to pursue his academic research more intensively. He was succeeded in August by Dr. Halvard Ingerd, a St. Andrews PhD, former BSA student and Fitch bursary holder. In the library, our senior librarian, Penny Wilson Zarganis, handed over to Evi Charitudi, former librarian of the Nordic Library in Athens. Penny is pictured here uh, with other library staff, assistant librarian Sandra Pepilassis, Evgenia Viliotti, cataloger, cataloger of the recently donated clog collection, Kathy Donaldson, library research assistant, and of course, Bubalina, whose role, I confess, I've never fully understood. But this was no ordinary handover because Penny had worked at the BSA for 44 years, and we were delighted to host a farewell event at the end of June which although restricted to BSA staff because of restrictions in place, so many video messages sent in, many warm video messages sent in from around the world, this particular one arriving from Australia. The beautifully painted pebble you see on the left by Lito Apostolaku, housed appropriately in a catalog card box with pages from Serum's Gods, Graves and Scholars, was one of the gifts Penny received, marking the affection in which he was held by generations of library users. So in closing, I take this opportunity to thank all BSA staff in Athens, Knossos and London for all they have done for the BSA over the past year, more so than ever in this challenging year we are, we've experienced. It's absolutely true that without them, the program summarized here would simply not have been possible. I also thank all of you who have supported us financially through regular, one -off donation, regular or one-off donations, large or small, during a year that has been challenging for us, as it has been for the whole world. Your generosity has allowed us to maintain our key activities, not least library acquisitions. And we're most grateful to you all. On that positive note, and with every hope that next year I will see all of you in person on this occasion, I thank you for your attention and end my report on the work of the BSA in 2020. Stay safe, stay well. <laughs>